this tutorial, we're going to discuss army organization, specifically the ideal unit composition for your core, the ideal unit size for your particular units, the type of weaponry that you should equip with them, um, both kind of beginning a game and then as you evolve through through the through the campaign, and then kind of some ideas in terms of uh, officers. Um, I do have a video on officers and that sort of thing, so I'm not going to go too much into this, but I'm going to touch on it a little bit because it does impact um, effectiveness of the units on the battlefield. Before I jump in, as always, um, if you find this video helpful, please like it. If you're not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe. Um, primarily because it just helps people find the channel and find these tutorials. <clears throat> and then your comments, adding additional insight, uh, questions, those sort of things, along with people finding these videos, I think encourages more people to play these type of games. And that, that's why we do this stuff, is to get people involved. So, what I've done here is I've created a, a core, ignore the, the disposition for the moment. This isn't how I would uh, do a disposition for a core. But I'm doing this for demonstrative pur purposes to lay out uh, ideal unit size and then um, the evolution of the weaponry for that particular unit as you evolve through the campaign. So think of this as a timeline from left to right. Um, left being your ideal unit size, and then we're going to talk about the, the weaponry that you would start with. Uh, and then as you progress through the game, um, that brigade, how it, you know, as it evolves, what are the things you should be equipping it with? Okay, so um, first part of this video, I'm going to focus on Confederate infantry, and then I'm going to switch over show you the Union infantry. And then after that, um, I'll probably just stick with um, the Confederate side of things, just because at that point there's not much um, variation between the Union and the, the, the Confederates. So for whatever reason, the ideal unit size seems to be about 18, um, about between 15 and 2,000, um, with people saying the sweet spot's about 1845 in terms of your unit size. Bear in mind, that's going to be a unit that has combat experience. Okay, so I don't think there's anything wrong with starting a green brigade as 250, because they're largely going to be a meat shield. They're going to soak up a lot of damage to start. Um, but then once you start getting veterans in that unit, and you're trying to maintain its veterancy, you know, whether it's a one star or two star, you're going to want to try and kind of keep it below 2,000 at the most, but probably maybe below 1,800. Um, a lot of people like to roll with a 1,500 brigade. You know, take it for what it's, however you want to do it. Um, the game does have scaling, which I have a separate video for, or will do a separate video for, which kind of, I think, helps address why people like to keep their brigades a little bit smaller. Um, but just know that anything above uh, about 1845, you're going to have some diminished return, but not much. Not like you are with artillery, for example. Um, so just th the reason I highlight that is, you know, it may seem like, oh, I want to have a 2,500-man brigade and keep it at that. But the reality is, is when you have costs that go into maintaining that brigade, along with the weaponry and so forth, um, it's just not worth it. So between 1,500 and 2,000, I think, is a good number to, to sustain for a particular brigade, which may also dictate your um, career points and how much you want to put in an army organization, because uh, army organization does dictate the size of a brigade. You want to start off with Confederates using the uh, Springfield 1842. Don't, don't do the reboard farmer. It's, it's a waste of time. <laughs> it's just, it's a dollar more for the uh, 42 uh, Springfield, and you can actually fire with it. The reboard farmer, it, you might as well just be throwing the, the gun at, at the enemy. It's just not very effective. Um, it's, its range is only 220. Your 1842 is going to have a range of 250. Um, its accuracy is 12.5. Reboard farmer, it's only, it is 12.5 also, but your fire rate is going to be slower and um, less range. So just go with the Springfield. There'll be plenty of these available uh, to start the game. Uh, then when as your unit progresses and say it gets to a one star, let's pretend this is a one star. Uh, also, you know, maintain equipping it with the Springfield 1842. But then as soon as you can, try and equip it with this Mississippi 1841. Um, this is an ex excellent musket. It's affordable. So let's see Mississippi... 17 as opposed to the 11 in the Springfield, so it's definitely affordable. So I would do this or the or the Palmetto. So if you want to talk about progression of, of firearms, go with the uh, Springfield 1842 and slash Palmetto, and then um, the Mississippi 1841 slash Lorenz. Lorenz is more expensive, but it's also a, it's a dependable firearm. It's kind of good for your kind of um, blossoming brigade that is no longer you know necessarily green. Um, just bear in mind that the, the Lorenz is a little more expensive, so from the CSI, CSA standpoint, 
Um, if you're giving this to too new of a brigade, you, your, your chances are going to lose a fair amount of them um, just to casualty and capture. So. Um, but definitely, I think for two star, it's safe to, to roll with the, 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 the Lorenz um, or even the, uh, the Mississippi. Okay, But I'd say for your newer or your getting into your one stars, the Mississippis slash Lorenz, Lorenz for two star or kind of um, if you need to for your one star. And then for your two-star brigades, um, I think you should start evolving into these um, pattern 1853 infields or um, Harper Ferry variant of the spring. So Springfield 1855 or the Harper's Ferry variant. There's an 1855 Harper's Ferry and an 1859 Harper's Ferry. Uh, so down here, so the Harper's Ferry 1855 or the Springfield 1855 are excellent for your two-star brigades. Um, just you're going to have to check the shop and then check your armory to see if anything's been captured because those tend to be a little bit less supply too for the CSA and the pattern in 1853. So to summarize, new units, Springfield, slash, you know, uh, slash Palmetto, slash this 1842 Palmetto, one stars, 1841s slash Lorenz. Two stars, you can go with the Lorenz, the pattern 1853 infield, Springfield 1855, or your Harper's Ferry variant. So 55 and a 59 Harper's Ferry. And then for your three stars, um, you could, again, get away with like the the, uh, the Harper's Ferry. What you want to do with your three stars, though, is your most expensive gun that you can give that brigade, do it, whatever that might be. Um, I want to say most expensive, but most effective gun. So if you have the Fayettevilles, obviously that's the ideal one. You're going to have to use reputation and so forth to get enough of these to put in a brigade, though. But you're going to want to equip your three-star with, like, the Fayetteville or the CS Richmond or the Harper's Ferry 1855. Really, whichever gun you have that's going to be the most effective is what you're giving your three-star. Because your three-star, one, shouldn't be really involved in any melee combat. Two, shouldn't be really getting shot at unless it's absolutely imperative. And then three, they're going to be in the reserve and coming up to, to save your line. So you want them to be elite shock troops. Okay, I'm going to switch over to Union real quick, go over the infantry um, weapons for the Union just right fast, and then we'll switch over and finish off the rest of the video focusing on these other aspects here. Okay, so I'm going to go through this stuff here really quickly. Um, part of the reason I wanted to cover the Union just a little bit separately was that you do have more resources and tend to have more firearms that come available to you throughout the campaign. And so I grabbed the same exact battle here as I was using for the Confederates, but you're already going to see a difference in terms of the availability of firearms for the Union. So you're going to start off with the 1842 Springfield as well for your um, new green unit. Um, and then what you're going to do is evolve up to a slash Palmetto. So you can also use the Palmetto for, for a new unit. Um, just know that as you progress through the game, you might end up having you know a stock in the armory of of say Lorenz muskets. Then feel free to use um, you know either your Lorenz or um, your Springfield 1855. So you might have a fair number of these type of guns. Um, so you can use that for your you know one stars for example. Then your Lorenz again, just like you with the Confederates. Um, <clears throat> However, you might be able to start equipping your troops sooner with the, the pattern 1853s than, than you would with the Confederates. Um, so that, that's going to be your option for your one stars, perhaps. It's going to be your pattern and in, fields 1853s. But what I really wanted to show you with the Union versus the Confederates is that, notice here, the Springfield 1861. If you recall correctly, that, that wasn't available to the, to the, the CSA. That, that wasn't an option. So you're already going to have a little bit, as the campaign goes to the game, those sort of additional available options that you just don't have with the Confederates. Uh, and you'll have the money to, to get them. So with that in mind, what you want to do is your two and three stars, equipping them with the, the most effective firearms you have, and just be aware that these kind of uh, firearms might be in stock, whereas they wouldn't be with the CSA. So if you're, using, if you're used to playing as the Confederates, it'd probably be helpful to kind of take a peek uh, as a union as you play through, look at the armory to see what uh, new firearms might be available that you perhaps wouldn't be otherwise familiar with. Also note though, the Fayettevilles aren't here. So um, they just have other types of uh, long rifles, to be honest. I'm not really familiar with with uh, many of these um, for, for infantry purposes. 
Um, I do know that Springfield 1861 is an excellent firearm. Um, the efficiency is fantastic. The reload is pretty good. And so you want to you want to be looking for these Harper Fairies and these spring these late model Springfields as you um, progress through the game. Okay, so that, that's just what I wanted to hit on really quick with the Union. Uh, let's flip back and look at the other particular units. Okay, so for cavalry, just know there's two different types. I did do a separate video on cavalry, so if you're interested in a more in-depth discussion on that, um, please see the, that, that video. But there's two different types. There's skirmish cavalry and there's melee cavalry. Note that if you like to dismount your cavalry and use them kind of like skirmishers, a 375 size unit is going to be effective for you. Um, so you don't need as many troopers in this particular type of unit than you would, for example, melee. That being said, there's nothing wrong with having a 500, 600, 700 um, size force of skirmish cavalry, especially if you're kind of using it as like um, anti-cavalry to fend off enemy um, cavalry. Uh, just note that there is a bit of a diminished return after you get it past about 600. Um, it's really just kind of based on the cost to maintain, you know, fully full size 750 unit force. Um, Versus the losses that it suffers, versus you know maybe having two, 500 size instead of you know one 750 or whatever. Um, so, just bottom line is with the the skirmishing cavalry, you can get away with the 375 and be be good. Um, what I would recommend you do is start off with the um, Sharps model 1855. That's probably what you're going to sh start off with, and then eventually as you get the the resources, convert them over the 1861 infields. These seem to be the the, the good options for these. Um, type of units. For melee, it's going to be a little bit different, right? Because they're probably going to suffer a bit more casualties on the battlefield as you use them just by nature of them being engaged in melee. So you're going to want them a bit, bit larger for sure. Um, <clears throat> that being said, you know, with cavalry, you can kind of get away with really any size unit. Um, but same rule for them as well, for whatever reason, there does tend to be a bit of a diminishing return after you get past about 600 um, troopers. Uh, largely due to the fact that, again, maintenance, cost, um, at some point, you know, you want two instead of one. Um, and so just, just be aware of that. But, you, again, you can get away with 750 and be just fine. Uh, but you also be very effective with between five and 600. You're going to want to start off with the Palmettos, which are very cheap. And um, it's usually, what, what, you know, they're kind of like the, the Springfield 42 of the, of the group. But have um, very good melee. And then eventually get the, the Lamats which are phenomenal. Melee's all the way high. Reload time's great. Um, that's what you're going to eventually want to evolve into. Okay, so for your skirmishing units, um, I'm going to show you basically three different ways to do skirmishing unit. So 375 seems to be the ideal number, as I mentioned with the skirmish cavalry. And you can either create snipers or harassers. So snipers, you're going to be using these Whitworths, which are really expensive, but awesome. Um, you can see the Whitworth is 140 per. But you don't need a very large group for it, right? So you can go 375 or even 300. And uh, I don't know, like, these are going to be in short supply, and they're going to be even more short supply for the CSA. So you may not be able to have more than one unit with Whitworths, but they're great sniper units. And if you get their perks up correctly, like I talk about in my perk video in terms of... Um, cover and stealth and those sort of things uh, they can be very effective or your harassing type skirmishing unit which is going to be your, your sharps model 1855 to start um, <clears throat> what they're going to be doing though is look at the range it's only 230 as opposed to the Whitworth which is 500 so they're going to be largely just kind of harassing the enemy so you want these guys fast you want them bouncing in and out um, but you, you don't want them trying to necessarily pick off anybody. Use them on the flanks and then use them in support with the, the infantry. Now, one third way to use kind of a skirmishing-like unit is to go ahead and create the smallest possible infantry unit you can, like this 500, for example. Or, say you have a, a, an infantry unit that just got tore up and they only have like 300 dudes left or whatever. Um, equip them with a really nice rifle. Like, for example, here, the CS Richmond, which has a, an effective range of 375. 
So it's kind of in the middle of this Whitworth here and your sharps and use them like you would a skirmishing unit. Um, not as effective because they're not going to be as fast, right? They're going to be relatively slow. Um, they're not going to be able to get out of trouble like these guys can, but it's a cheaper option. And it's, you know, in case you don't, you don't like skirmishing units, but you still want to kind of have a little bit of that capability. You can build, you know, a small infantry unit that has a really nice gun and, and use them kind of, kind of like skirmishers, like a hybrid, basically. Just be aware that they're not going to have the flexibility of the speed that these guys do. Okay, artillery. Um, artillery size tends to be the sweet spot is between 12 and 14 guns. Um, there seems to be a consensus out there that that is like the no kidding 12 or 14. Like, it's not like cavalry where you can go between 250 and 750 and, and, and not really uh, be affected at all. Artillery, if you have too few guns, it's just not going to be optimal. And if you have too many guns, there's going to be a, a, a diminishing return there, which can be pretty considerable depending on the type of gun you have in there, right? Because, for example, the 24-pound howitzer is $3,100 per gun. So if you have more than 14, then you're going to start seeing a, a, a significant diminishing return there um, for, for your, your money. Yes, sir. You're going to start off with the six pounders. Um, I would say they're, I wouldn't say they're totally worthless because I do think they have their uses. Um, I think a battery of six pounders up close shooting canister can be effective, right? If anything, to, to de de demoralize the enemy and cause them to rout. Um, but don't expect a lot from them. You know, they're not going to get many casualties, um, medium to long range. And uh, they probably won't be, even be doing much damage canister wise. But they can demoralize the enemy, right? So they have their uses. Um, that kind of gets to my next point is you're going to be looking at either long range or short range artillery. And so depending, you, you kind of want to have a mix and match of both in your in your core. Um, I would recommend early on your short range is going to be your 12 pound Napoleons. These are kind of a nice stop gap until you can get the money and the resources to get the better artillery. But the thing I like with the, the, the 12 pounders is that they work really good in conjunction with your infantry. So as your infantry line moves up, you move your Napoleons up. If you're holding a defensive line, they're great for a static defense. Um, either put in canister or, uh, or, sh or a case shot into the enemy. Um, for those of you who don't know, there's, there's kind of a couple different ammo types you can use for an artillery piece, which I'm going to do in a separate video. I'm going to go into detail artillery. But you have long range, which is your single shot which is like your no kidding cannonball, right? At kind of mid range, you have your shell shot or otherwise it's, they call it case shot, which is kind of like a cannonball, but inside it has a bunch of shrapnel and there's a fuse and it either explodes in the air or explodes on contact and shoots the shrapnel everywhere. And while you're, if you watch the cinematics in the game, you'll see, you can see your artillery shooting different types of ammo depending on, you know, the distance of the enemy. Uh, and then at close range is your canister, right? Which I think this is where these two guys, the 12 pounders and the six pounders are really helpful. Um, kind of helpful mid range, but not so much. Again, you're going to be trying to get these guys at a minimum at case shot range, but preferably canister. Then when you can afford it, you want to go up to the 10 pound Tredegars. So with these guys, what's great with them is that they're your long range artillery piece that can also work effectively at mid range. Um, notice the damage is a little down, but their efficiency is really good. So they're pretty good uh, long-range artillery piece. They're relatively affordable. Um, you know, 2400 to put it in perspective, your 12-pounders are 1600 So what you can do early game is mix and match between your 12-pounders and your 10-pounders. And then what you want to do is upgrade your 10-pounders to 20-pound parrots, because these guys are phenomenal. Um, not only do they do a lot of damage, but they're also very efficient. And their range is great. So the range is 2,000. Um, I don't like the 10 pounders very much. Uh, they're just, their damage is not very good. And their efficiency is okay, but I don't like them. But if you can get up to the uh, the 20 pounders, which is basically means you're upgrading your 10 pounders. And then think of it this way, you're upgrading your 12 pound Napoleons to howitzers. Right? Howitzers are expensive, but I think pretty much everybody agrees the best artillery piece in the game especially close range. Um, They're just absolutely devastating close range. So Confederates, you do a fair amount of defending in the game. 
These guys are golden, uh, and they're worth the money. I know they're expensive, but they're worth the money. Uh, and then, you know, get as many of those as you can in a battery. Um, again, 12 to 14 is ideal for that. Okay. Um, I'm going to just take a very quick break here, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to restructure my core here so it kind of lay it out the way I think ideally um, you'd, you'd want to lay out your, your core with some explanation as to why. And then, um, as always, if you have any additional comments that you want to make about, you know, firearm type or unit size or any of those sort of things, please, please, please include them in the comment section. I read them. Other people read them. I think it's very helpful. And the more discussion, the better. So what I did here is I took um, all the various units I have and restructured them into um, the core in kind of the way that perhaps you should do it in your playthrough. So a couple things that I want to touch on before I dive into the um, organizational piece of this particular core is first and foremost, um, you want to have your weakest units at the vanguard of your particular army. Uh, what I mean by that is you want your weaker units at the front of your army. So whatever units are going to be taking the battlefield first, you want those to be your weaker units. Reason being is that you don't want your three-star units or your you know uh, experienced two-star units to be taking casualties throughout the battle, right? You want them to come in in the reserve or kind of in the middle of the battle to turn the tide. What you want is those weaker units to kind of absorb a lot of the damage and act as meat shields um, so that they can take all the damage, weaken the enemy, so that when your experienced units come up to the front, they can kind of turn the tide and um, push the battle in your favor. Number two is predominantly you're going to want your cores populated by infantry. So... Um, I say, you know, again, I think there's any, you can play this game any variety of ways, but I, I would see this very difficult to beat, um, you know, a predominantly infantry core with all cavalry or something, right? Um, so in this setup, we have basically two divisions of infantry, which I think is a good mix. You probably want about this, many, this much infantry, at least, um, in comparison to what else we have here. Um, so I'd say at least this much infantry, if perhaps not more. The, the Civil War was very much about mass and about numbers, and this game isn't any different. Um, you're going to want numbers in the battlefield to compete with your enemy. And then what you're going to want to do is you're going to put them, a lot of people do this at least, put them all in a particular division. So that way when you're on the battlefield and you click the, the division key that's in the bottom part of the, the battle screen, it'll highlight all four brigades for you instead of you having to click each individual brigade to move them. So that's one, one benefit is that uh, in the the course of the battle, you can click your division tab and it'll highlight all those brigades and move them, you can move all of them at one time. But also there's a hidden benefit in the sense that if you want to merge, say, Penrose's big brigade with Barrett's brigade in the battle, then um, you can only do it within a particular division. So I can't, I can't merge Penrose's brigade with Ashmore's, for example, because they're in two different divisions. Well, if you've been moving all these independently and now you want to merge these two, they may be on two separate parts of the map. And infantry take quite some time to move, um, so it may be difficult, if not impossible, to merge these two units. Uh, in terms of merging units, I discussed that in a separate video, so feel free to go find that if you're interested in terms of what I'm talking about with merging brigades. Um, and then finally, before I move on to the, the other units, uh, you want to dedicate your veterans to no more than two or three infantry brigade. Um, early in the game until maybe early to mid-1863. The reason I say that is you want to get yourself as soon as possible having a couple of crack, you know, three-star iron-like brigades that you can use to throw into, um, you know, an enemy flank, help your flank from collapsing, whatever. Basically any situation where you find the battle is turning either in your favor or against it to, to, to use those particular crack brigades. Uh, the quickest way to get that is to consolidate your veterans and spend them only on two or three brigades at a time. So, until early or mid-63, you should only be taking your veterans and putting them in to, for example, Manson and Barrett. Maybe a lot of your brigades lose a lot of troops, but they should be replenished with rookies, and your veterans should be spent on Barrett and Manson. For the rest of your veterans, I'd say put them into your artillery, because you want to get your artillery up to two or three stars as soon as possible. And the quickest way to do that, obviously, is by putting veterans into them. Um, those two or three stars for artillery is going to be far more advantageous than trying to spread out your veterans among infantry and having a bunch of mediocre infantry brigades. Okay, 
Um, so we've talked about uh, having your infantry under one particular division, which again, you don't have to, but that's one suggested way of um, microing your forces on the battlefield. Taking your veterans and consolidating them to maybe two infantry brigades, at least to start, until you get three stars in those, and then maybe you know spread it out from there. And then also putting veterans in your artillery. Now what I like to do is I like to use at least two, maybe three, artillery uh, cavalry units per corps, and I like to stick them in their own division. The reason is, is that I like to click that division tab in the battlefield and grab both of these guys and have them both do the same thing together. Um, this is the, the most effective way to accomplish that. I don't like to put my skirmishing in with the cavalry because I like my cavalry to work independent and the skirmishers just simply can't keep up. Um, so skirmishing unit, you can kind of stick wherever. I don't think there's necessarily a good or bad place to have them. Um, you know, if you have multiple skirmishing units, then perhaps have own, your own division for them. But you can stick them, you know, with your infantry, with your artillery, whatever. With your artillery, you can have them own, all in their own uh, division. So that you can kind of use them the same way you would your infantry in terms of clicking that division tab. Uh, you can stick them in with your infantry. That's, you know, obviously an approach as well. So maybe you want each division to kind of be able to work independent of the rest of the army. So you'd have like an artillery battery in there to kind of support it. Or what you can do is take your artillery and, and divide them. So that you have your fourth division, you click that, you have these two artillery batteries. And then they can kind of maybe hold down one flank. And then your fifth division can hold down the other flank. Or the center or whatever you want to do. Um, so artillery also I think are rel relatively flexible. You could certainly you know, put them up here with your with your uh, infantry. And then maybe have your skirmisher by himself. So just kind of think about that, that the way you set it up in the in the, the camp screen here can really affect your ability to, to effectively micro on the battlefield, depending on how you, you set it up. Um, and now with that, that is going to conclude this video. As always, please like and subscribe if you found this helpful. It's going to um, ensure that other people find the video. And if you have any additional comments on army organization, things that you've learned, things you want to add, questions you have, please include them in the comments section. Thank you. Oh, and one thing I forgot to add. <laughs> I like to have this second core over here, even in battles like Shiloh, where you can only have one core, because you can warehouse troops here. So you can ensure these troops don't enter the battlefield because they're in the second core, and only the first core is going to enter the battlefield. Um, additionally, what you can do is you can use this is if you're out of room here, say you're out of room um, on, on this core because maybe your army organization is not high enough or you just have that many troops, you can use this second core to move troops out, like say Trimble, and then that way now I can move him around. Um, so having a second or third core, depending on where you're at in the game, can be helpful even if you're not using it to warehouse troops and then also use it to kind of move troops around and that sort of thing.